Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to our final EdConnect virtual event of the year, preparing for your early career at panel discussion. And we've been joined by some fantastic panelists this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in to our event. So just to give you a brief overview of who we've got on our panel, and then I'll give you a brief overview of how the event's going to work. We have Abby Bayford, who is a Director of Institute at the Academy Transformation Trust and Expert Advisor at the Teacher Development Trust. We've got Alex, who is a um, experienced professional mentor and curriculum leader of technology. We've got Amy, who is a soon to be early career teacher in the sunny United Arab Emirates. So I can't say I'm not jealous at all. Um, and we have Chris Darla, who is an executive head teacher of an infant and junior school in London and one of the national leaders of Women in England. We were supposed to be joined by Anika as well, who is a senior lecturer in initial teacher education, but she's unfortunately not very well this morning. So we do wish her well and we thank you, thank her for initially coming to join us for the event. So um, just so those in our audience are aware, this event is not a webinar about the early career framework. So it's not an information session where we tell you what the early career framework is about. There's lots of information out there from the Department of Education, Chartered College of Teaching, all about how um, the ECF works, as well as the different partner delivery providers. What this event's all about is getting those different perspectives of different people um, involved in that delivery um, or involved um, in participation of that early career framework. So the first question I'm going to ask everybody is when the early career framework was sort of announced or when you first heard about it, what were your initial thoughts? And I think, Amy, as you're going to be a participant of that early career framework, it, I thought it'd be good to start with you maybe as what you first thought when you heard about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think... <sighs> So when we were, when I was in my second year of training, we didn't know anything about it. It was more about the NQT year and we hadn't been briefed on that either. So personally, like focusing on studies and just trying to get through university, I hadn't really looked into the framework. So when the ECF came out and, you know, there was things like if you fail it, you, ca you can't be a teacher again, like you can't do it again. Like that scared me immediately. But that was already in the NQT framework well guidance because they're a bit different because the framework's a lot more um it's more of a framework than just like guidelines for schools to follow um so like immediately I was a bit like oh that's quite scary um but I think looking into it like we've had sessions from university on it now and I just I, th I do think it's brilliant it's more support it's there for us and I think um I've always said in terms of teacher training you can it's almost luck of the draw sometimes because you can be put in a school that's really supportive and some schools who struggle to to provide you know sufficient support so it's, it is luck of the draw whereas this I think makes it consistent for all schools to be able to support you so I definitely think from a from a trainee standpoint it's definitely like I'm I'm happy that it, I'm happy that it's there now definitely yeah yeah and I, I, as someone who's also about to go through that I, th I think I agree that when anything new is announced, it's yeah. <laughs> quite sceptical at first and scared because often you hear about it and you hear about this big idea, but you don't hear about all the little practical things of how it's going to be implemented and how it's going to, to work. Um, but yeah, I totally agree that it, it's going to, I think from everything that's sort of come out now, it is a really positive change. Um, so Alex, as um, a met from a mentor's perspective then, how do you feel? Because obviously mentoring has always been important for trainees and NQTs, but with this new early career framework, in a way there seems to be a bit more of like a heightened focus on that, the importance and the role of a mentor. So what did you think about it when you first heard about it? Um, the first thing I thought was I was quite jealous because I didn't have it when I was going into my NQT year, um, because I think the biggest change it really well not the biggest change but the biggest focus is that element of support because that's what's really important to keep our good teachers in their careers we need to support them and um, it's not an easy career at all you I mean we all we all we've all had those days um, and we need support all the time throughout that um as a mentor again my rationale of wanting to be a mentor over what three 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 four years ago now was to support the colleagues because you you as a mentor you can observe other people and you can see there is amazing elements in their teaching practice that you want them to kind of mirror in every lesson and, and, and you want to be able to kind of challenge them and empower them 
Um, so for us as a school and as a mentor, in terms of our changes, we're really excited about it because it gives us a chance to really flourish and show local schools that what we do already is strong. Um, but also within my role, I, I, I'm developing a new role with it's basically going to kind of quality assure all of our subject mentors and curriculum mentors to ensure that we're going with the same rationale. It's support first. And obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll all be realistic about it. There are going to be elements where we have to challenge our colleagues and our, and, our, and our peers, which is fine. But you go in with the first element of support. So I think the, I think the whole framework, in my opinion, will be good. It's going to be hard for some schools who have nothing how nothing in place right now because it is a big task um, and there needs to be a lot of stakeholders in, from the school to really build it up and make it a really good success but what i also have loved is um i've been on several um recruitment panels this year for for, for new staff including my in, in my own department and one of the questions when, when we asked them at the very end is about have you got any questions for us and every nqt has asked us about the framework so it shows that it is being filtered through universities or skip providers in terms of asking for it <clears throat> because when i was training you never asked for it you just you just took the job and you were lucky if you got your nqt hours whereas now it's quite nice and if it, i mean there's an element of entitlement there to know what you've got and what you deserve to have because we want to keep our, our, our good teachers in the career so yeah I, overall i would say quite positive yeah, that's great. Thank you, Alex. And then, so Cristala, from a head teacher's point of view, then, like when with regards to sort of one, say, any recruitment you've had to have done for new staff, but also any changes you had to make to your professional development within the school, how do you, how did you feel when you first heard about the rollout of the ECF? I'm actually really quite, I was actually really quite excited because it, it married really well with my philosophy. So um, my style of recruitment um, predominantly is linked to growing your own. So we often had PGCEs or school direct trainees. Um, and that was the best route because I felt we gave them the most support um, and, and got to know the school, you know, warts and all before being appointed. And it, it's worked for the seven years I was a head before. Um, in my new setting, what excited me more was previously as a head, I've always given NQTs an additional year with a mentor. I've always given them their NQT release time plus, 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 but that's not always the case. And I'm working with a family of schools that definitely understands that, but I'm also working in a borough that understands that. So the, the support that is being provided currently mirrors what I've always done, but the new framework ensures that everybody gets that. And I think speaking with my women ed hat on, um, sometimes it's quite daunting to speak up for your entitlement. Sometimes it's quite daunting if you don't have the facility or platform to network. And I think self-care is obviously, you know, key to success in, in education as a whole, but also learning from others and having that time to understand sometimes it's okay not to be okay and nobody knows everything. I don't know everything and I've been ahead for X amount of years. So I think the, the whole way it's structured with the opportunity to research, to, to you know, to, to take risks, to be supported, clarity on what the induction tutor has to do, clarity to what the mentor has to do. I've worked ahead, a year ahead, so ensured that the people I've picked to be induction tutor and mentor have had training. So one's on a master's course with the uh, National College um, halfway through, and my other one is undertaking a coaching and mentoring programme again with the National College. But I just think the best way I can equip my staff to support new staff is to equip them with the right CPD and that's kind of the thread I'm going with. So if we're all, and post all that, so within the first year, we're already setting up a type of coaching circle, like the lesson um, study style of trios. And every NQT then was included and every ECT now will be included. So it, it fits in, it aligns perfectly with what my philosophy is. So I was shouting from the rooftops, to be honest. That sounds great. And I think that also links to what Amy and Alex have talked about, about that, that the ECF is going to just provide that consistency. So yeah. like schools like yours, and there's probably met lots of other schools out there that have yeah. done have done that and have always done something like that. But it's just providing that extra layer of support across. 
as well. I think one of the barriers for some heads that I've been talking to was budget. You know, how do you budget for this? And you really do have to think outside the box and you really do have to form, you know, trusting relationships with your current staff so that release isn't a problem. So it's all, you know, our timetables are set for September already because I don't want to be thinking about it. I want it already thought about. It's not an add on. This is a part of our academic term we've got to make sure that we're ready to receive ECT so that you know we 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 face any challenges together that will occur but I don't want to create challenges by not being ready so I think as from a, a leadership point of view I think costs were the main concern oh my god how does that work it's now not one year it's two but um not a not not a real concern for me to be honest fantastic and then Thank you, Christelle. And Abby, from your perspective, working across a trust, and I assume you already had something obviously in place for your NQTs and stuff. How did you find with the ECF? Has that um, how has that moulded into what you, you you're already doing to what you're going to be doing? There's a real theme that seems to run through the conversations this morning about inequity, and that was one of my primary concerns when I became director of institute at ATT. Um, professional development was only as good as what the school was able to offer and so we worked really hard to ensure that we didn't become a matter of the postcode lottery and actually we were pooling our resources and really thinking about our offer in a more holistic way not just for early career teachers but you know there were obviously a group of learners we, we considered. When the early career framework was announced it was really exciting because we'd already affirmed our commitment to induction We'd already recognised that it's a steep learning curve and you, you can't possibly cover all the prerequisite knowledge you would want a teacher to have in a year. It's an ongoing learning process. So the fact that that was formally recognised for a two year induction period was reassuring, but also the fact that it has a really robust evidence base. So we know more than we've ever known before about how students learn, how to assess children, curriculum design. And it brings all of that together beautifully with the national professional qualifications too. So for the first time in our profession, it seems we've got a really nice golden thread that runs through all teacher professional development now. So we haven't got this stop start feel to PD. Colleagues are able to see that they are embarking on a journey of lifelong learning. And I think that's really helped our early career teachers to feel more motivated to learn so they're not feeling like they're in this novice stage and everyone else has seemingly acquired expertise but rather that expertise is a continuum and that you know whatever stage you are in your teaching career there is still more to learn so like I said that golden thread that runs through all the qualifications formally recognizes that mentality. Yeah I think that's a really good point that now that and I think for an early career teacher you probably sometimes just think about that first job but you're not necessarily think or just assume oh well I'll be especially for example from a primary perspective I'll be a teacher then I might be a middle leader then I'll become a, a assistant head then I'll become a deputy head, then I'll become a head but actually that the, these qualifications um really do sort of shine a light on how many different career paths there are in education and how and that the professional development there that sort of from the basis of that strong foundation in your early career, how, where that can then lead. And I think like I've personally felt really motivated, probably even more so now because of all that. So I think that's a really good point. So thank you, Abby. So we've sort of touched on this briefly, but now we're going to sort of think about regards to preparing for the early career framework. So Alex, from your role as a mentor, what sort of um, preparation have you had or been involved with or are going to be involved with from a mentor's perspective? So we are rolling out a kind of a, a coaching qualification and um, so our school is linking up with um, oh, I think it's Leadership Edge and um, their coaching provision and um, so I'm in the, in the currently in, in the middle of currently being trained to be a coach um, and then we'll, we'll be filtering that down to other middle leaders or subject mentors and um, to support obviously trainees or ECTs and um, again 
in, in, I'm, I'm very lucky I work in a very supportive school where everything that we've all been speaking about we kind of already do or touch on and it's about making sure that we're trained and we're equipped and we have the time and the resources to be able to invest into it to make sure that we do a really really good job at it when when, when we do get our um, ECTs in, in, in school from September and we are we're, we're in a good position we're led by an amazing assistant head in our school who's kind of leading the whole world process and um, who's got such a vision for it and i think that's the thing I, I, as Christelle said it's about make, thinking outside the box and um, you mean the the, the the framework is there for a reason but there are obviously going to be constraints for everybody but i think if you've got the right people around you to support you but also to challenge you and to um, push that vision forward then i'm sure it, it, it's okay from a from a professional um perspective for myself I've just carried on reading and I've kind of and I've done a lot more work um trying to connect with ECTs and see exactly what they want, what do they need. Um so a lot of our we've got five new ECTs starting in September um, and already we're in contact with them quite quite frequently, um, either as middle leaders or as or as induction mentors or, or professional mentors to see basically what support is it that they need and to tell us so therefore we can put it in place for them since day one. And um, we all we, we have a buddy system with, which we've put in place. So we've got a more informal role for all of our ECTs as well as the curriculum um, mentor or induction tutor as well. So again, I think we've, 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 we've put a lot in place, but I think the, the team that I'm working with are really passionate about this whole induction process. And I think if you've got that passion behind you, then anything is really possible for it. Um, so I would just say to anybody, just you mean read up about it, but also, and again, I, I think that was a really, really good point that Christelle made earlier on, especially with the whole 10% braver approach, ask. I mean, it, it's fine to ask and be brave and get and get your opinion heard, um, and hopefully you'll find someone that will will, will take you, will, will listen to you, and will will be able to support you. Thanks, Alex. And I think that's a really important point about listening to the ECT's point of view, especially as the first cohort that's going to go through it. With anything new, it is going to be that some things will be a little bit trial and error, or some things won't work as they intended, and actually by speaking up ready for them the next generation of the next cohort, but also your own cohort so that you can continue to be successful. I think that's really important. So thinking about that voice then, Amy, what sort of preparation did your teacher training provider give you um, and what information have they given you with regards to the early career framework? Um, so we had a, a lecture on it by our tutor who's kind of leading the whole EC. Uh, ECT kind of framework so she will she's there for us to contact throughout the year years even though you know we've left uni she's kind of like our point of contact um, if we have any issues um, so we had um, a kind of lecture on it and we had a Q&A where we could like ask questions and stuff and she went really in depth into it and I think it's like 43 pages so we kind of went through all of that and it was quite arduous but it was really informative and kind of broke down all of the because I think when you read, when I read it initially, anyway, this is per, like from me personally. I there was things that that shot out at me, and I was like, "What?" So where going through it with someone who's kind of explaining how that really works was really helpful. Um, so she kind of went through kind of the options that your school can take. She went through, you know, like the supply route. Um, I think you can do supply for five years before you would have to do your induction and things like that. Um, she went briefly over how it works for international schools. Obviously, I'm I'm going to be going in, in uh, international, so how that would work for me, um, which was really helpful. So just, yeah, it, I, did, I don't think it needed too much time put on it, um, but a nice like Q&A session where we could just kind of ask any question at all really helped and just kind of like calmed those nerves because it is quite daunting being told like if you fail this you can't do it again but you know she kind of put that to bed by saying it's re it's really 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 hard to fail it because you have so much support in place and that's the whole point of it is it's really hard to fail it so yeah that was um that was good to hear <laughs> and I think it's good that what they've that they explain not just actually because I think it'd be very easy for you to just tell an ECT you know this is the content of the framework this is the mental support what you get but you know like how you've said like this is the delivery model that they could go, go down yeah. this how it applies yeah. to this sector or this sector and I think that's obviously really important yeah. it sounds like your university have given you a really good overview of the, yeah definitely and I think just to add to that as well for our final placement 
um, our end of professional practice form was laid out in the way that it will be for our ECT years. So, in ter- you know, like the five core areas. So that's how we were kind of um, given feedback on, which I think was really good because it kind of makes a kind of smooth transition into our into our ECT year. So that was I think that was really good. And I don't know if other universities do that, but uh, yeah, I, I would suggest it because it was really helpful. That sounds great. Thank you, Amy. And Abby, you, I suppose you deal with lots of different stakeholders with regards to the early career framework because you'll be dealing with the, like, strategically leading the ECTs, the mentors, and, they, say, the head teachers. So what sort of things have you been doing with those stakeholders to prepare them? And like Amy said, to sort of ease the nerves of everyone, because I think it's probably important to remember with this webinar that it's not just the ECTs that might be nervous, but it might be the mentors, especially new mentors, or it might be head teachers as well. Obviously, Cristal has talked about the logistics of it a bit um, earlier. So what sort of things have your trust been doing? Yeah, the mentorship role is really important. It's where we've put a lot of support. Um, I say this a lot, but I do think we're going from a Skoda to a Ferrari in terms of um, the skills that a mentor would require um you know they are a pedagogy coach um not just a coach and that's really important to recognize so what we've actually we can't presume that they have the substantive knowledge in the early career framework so a piece of work that we've done is ensuring that they are building familiarity with the evidence base they understand it they also understand the evidence base that underpins the pedagogy. So I think a mistake we can sometimes make in our professional development design is skipping straight to pedagogy without exploring the evidence base. And that's when you see all those wonderful lethal mutations in the classroom. So we've spent a lot of time with our mentors, really understanding the early career framework. When I trained 15 years ago, um, you know, although we probably did look at the science of learning, it certainly wasn't called that. So we've looked at the language in the early career framework as well, so that colleagues are confident in using that language too in the way that they talk to their ECTs. We've also done work with other stakeholders, so our principals, our professional development leads as well, so that they really understand the framework. Something else we've done is we've written a coaching programme to ensure that we have trained coaches in all of our academies. And that has been really important because although we've looked at the pedagogy, we also need to look at the pedagogy of coaching too. And I was really keen for coaching to look and feel the same in all of our academies, you know, just going back to that equity piece too. I still think there's a gap in terms of facilitating the early career teaching programme. So we are a delivery partner for that programme next year. And Again, there is a lot of pres- uh, there are a lot of presumptions that they will know the substantive knowledge in the framework, and so we have done some pre-teaching of that material with our facilitators so that they feel really confident. We've also talked about criticality of the evidence base, so that evidence bases are always evolving. So we've talked about the need to really think about with our early career teachers what that might look like in the classroom. So what does a really good evaluative conversation look like? Um, Because that's fundamental to inclusive practice, isn't it? So we need to create space for them to think about, Okay, the evidence base is telling me that the children will respond in this way, but they responded in this way. How do I deal with that? So sometimes we can be really conceptual and theoretical about our practice and we don't necessarily think about how we structure those evaluative conversations post the lesson for them to really think about well, what, you know, why didn't that quite work and what can we do differently next time? Fantastic. Thank you, Abby, for providing, providing that overview because it sounds like you've got every uh, a stakeholder covered there. So thank you. And Crystal, you briefly touched on this when you first spoke um, with regards to the preparations that it was something your school had already done was to, uh, the schools you'd work in that had provided the, the two years of support. Was there anything else you had to do or have um, that you sort of have done prepared that you haven't had before? Or was there anything, say, you've worked with other, co- say, other head teacher colleagues that have sort of reached out to you um, for that support in preparing? I think I think what it's not what I haven't done before, but I've I've not left anything to chance. So strategy was key for me. So I've made sure I've got. Um, an Abby and an Alex on board in order to support my Amy's, if you like, um, because I can't pretend to know everything. So I've trained up 
people to do that for me. Um, where I've come in is, is identifying how long that journey was going to be for us in prep. So I've also um, worked even more closely than ever with Tom Sherrington and Oliver Caviglioli with the walkthroughs with... So my current staff are all trained and understand what self-sustainability means, what it means to coach. Furthermore, we applied through, so the um, diocese for both Catholic and Church of England schools have been awarded um, the training to be facilitators for MPQs and our schools are leading on the coaching. So any of my staff I put forward and myself will again have refresher training for the national coaching qualification. So all that's been happening this year so that we're ready to fire on all cylinders. And, and I'm not going to repeat everything that everyone said, but everything everyone said has come into that journey. So I had to do the groundwork now. We have to have the understanding of all staff now. My governors needed to understand the financial commitment now because we're already struggling financially but but CPD and all um, the expenses that were necessary this year had to happen in order for next year to be successful but then you know we grow a strong staff and and we manage to retain great staff and you know the profession I mean it's it's we're proud to teach you know, this is the best job in the world. I'm probably the, not the only proudest head teacher, but I feel like I'm the proudest head teacher. And I'd like my ECTs to understand and share that pride. And that's why ensuring that they have the right tools in their toolkit to fire at all, with all cylinders was my priority. Strategy planning and don't leave anything to chance is kind of it. Make sure you've got the money behind you. Thanks, Christella. That's great. Now, the next sort of set of questions are ones that are very specific to each role that you've had and they're ones that have um, sort of been sent to us beforehand. So I'm just going to come back to you, Alex. We've spoken about, you know, the importance of the mentor and the support and that sort of is the key sort of underpinning theme of the early career framework. As Abby said, I mean, showing that equity um, for all our early career teachers and mentors. Do you feel your role as a mentor has changed in any way? Um. Personally, probably no, because I had amazing mentors myself who probably indirectly taught me to be a good mentor. Um, and like I said, I have a I have such a passion for being a mentor, um, whether it's a curriculum mentor, professional mentor, subject, subject mentor, whatever role type of mentor it is, I am a big believer that you support first. Um, and that is key um, to making sure that that, I mean, that person it, it recognises their successes, but also recognises what, what, what they need to work on, and, and it's a journey. Um, one of the key things I always say to a lot, a lot of trainees or ECTs is teaching like a jigsaw. You've got to try all these different ways of, of, of making it up first, and then you will eventually get it, um, but then it will still change, and you will still have to start again, and you will still have to do this again. And it's about kind of always that constant reflection and conversations that you have, whether it's a conversation in the corridor, whether it's a conversation in the classroom, whether it's a conversation with a mentor to say, can you come and observe me and encourage that, observa that observation? Um, in our school, we have something called the open door policy. So every single member of our staff has a continuous open door where anyone can walk in at any time um, and you just want to go in and see what's going on. And there's, there's no fear about it. It's not a negative thing. It's not looking and writing at the back on a piece of paper what you've done. It's having those conversations and seeing students in different in different, um, in different environments, et cetera, and being able to get support of people that have got more experience or other ECTs themselves or even other trainees. Um, and I think what people do forget sometimes is, I mean, teaching wouldn't, in my opinion, wouldn't evolve us so much without amazing ECTs or trainees. I mean, we need that new blood in our career. Um, and, and I've been teaching 10 years now, and I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done with everything, but I love that role because I'm able to watch trainees and think, oh, that's an amazing thing that they've just done. So simple, but so effective that I haven't seen before. Um, and I think, so for me personally, it hasn't changed now. I think one of the, 
what, what one of the challenges maybe if we use that word um, I'm looking for within my role over the next year is ensuring that all mentors have the same rationale and passion that I do and in our school that I have a feeling that won't be a challenge um, but I'm looking forward to making sure that again what everyone else has said I can put the time in with the mentors I can make sure that they've got the training there I can make sure that I'm there to support them as well because being a mentor isn't something that can just be a tick box you've got to have in my opinion a personal investment with it because at the end of the day you are you've got someone's careers in your hand and you need to support them through that journey and um, so for me personally probably not too much but i imagine for others maybe it could be a bit more of a change of their role and um, but again i i i i i, I can only echo what chris also said i love this career and i would never want to leave it um, and I think it's a privilege to have such a role within within this new framework um, and supporting people and making sure that they are they can be the best versions themselves, really. So, yeah. Thank you, Alex. And I'm sure any ECTs, and I can tell with the smiles on the panel, will be very lucky to be supported by you. So thank you for that. Um, so, Amy, now a specific question that came for um, towards ECTs was, at first, some people might have felt, as a, from a, a training perspective, you know, oh, well, it's two years now rather than one, and could have had quite an initial resistance to it going to the two years. Did, like, if you're going to be really honest, did you or any of your colleagues initially think about that? Because I think what a lot of people were worried about was that the practical side of it and not thinking about the supportive side of it, as in things like, Will it affect my pay? Will I be able to, you know, take on, I know, a, in a primary school, a subject leader role in my second year? Will I be able to do? Will I be able to move school between the first year and second year? So, what, did you or any of your colleagues initially feel any of that? A hundred percent. Like to be, as you said, to be completely transparent and clear. I think when it first came out. Um, the two th or two or three things that that were like or oh, were it's going to be two years so in terms of being like a fully qualified teacher that's now added an extra year so once you've done three years of training you have to do another two years um of course the pay it was like we're going to have two years of nqt pay but that's not true uh the pay scale works the same uh this is it's all the things that you think immediately because I, I don't know you think the worst immediately don't you so that was like oh we're gonna have two years of nqt pay but that's not true um Yes, we have two years ECT years, but I think EC, the, your ECT years aren't like your NQT year. They're just not the same. That it's for me personally, like I wouldn't say by any means or any stretch of the word that I am the best trainee teacher that I've that has ever walked the earth. But I feel like I've had I've been very lucky with my placements and I've had loads of support and I feel confident for my first ECT year. However, if there wasn't that you know mentor and the induction tutor in place I would be terrified like I feel a lot more calm because of the ECT year framework like I, I just think having someone I think as, as Alex said encouraging observations because I know that they can be scary but you learn so much from that you learn so much from your mistakes so it is daunting but that's where you grow the most that's what I experienced in, in my training anyway is the lessons that went horrific were the biggest lessons for you as a teacher so I think just having that that framework there for two years instead of one especially for those teachers who do feel really really daunted by you know being a full class teacher especially with how the year's gone with COVID and I know some people haven't really had much placement time um, I was really lucky to have a full placement. Some people are still on it or they haven't had, they were in for like two weeks. So I think it's, it's, it hasn't, it's, it's come at a perfect time, to be honest. I think it's, it's, it's great support. And I, I couldn't, Im like, I think the NQT year support was, was sufficient, but I think as, as we've said, this makes it consistent for everybody. And I think that's really important because it, you know, you don't want to be put with a school that just doesn't know how to support you. Whereas now they have this 43, 48 page framework that is there for all of you, like schools and for you, for yourself to, to, you know, to use to back up. And it's just, it's just supportive. And what, what's wrong with that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think like any change, especially any change announced by the Department for Education, people can be quite sceptical at first about it. Yeah, so definitely. It's really important that, um, you know, with anything. And I think one of the misconceptions that some people do really think about is that th this is the reason why the ECF has been brought in is because of COVID, when actually it was always, it's been on the cards for a number of years. And when I remember I knew about it and I said to one of my friends who was a trainee, 
oh, well, this has been around for, for eight, like the plan for ages, and it was always September 2021. It's not that because of COVID, it's just the early rollout has happened. Um, so thank you, Amy. And a similar sort of question now, like Cristala, and I think I think I could probably predict the answer because of how the passion that came across in your previous answer. But was there from not necessarily you, but any people that you've worked with or colleagues, especially say people that were taking an active part in early career teacher development already, was there any like initial worry or skepticism about it going to say a two year programme? I think the the concerns arose with with the length of time. So, you know, we're, we're spreading the year in two years. We're not. It's not doing the same thing. It's perhaps having a better impact and doing things differently. So I think communicating that we were going to be doing things differently in my current settings was the main priority to get that understanding, to read the documents, but also to start putting things in practice. So where I think Alex was saying, you know, it's about no fear. It was about making sure that we had that understanding and we were all on board with the same vision. So we all want to be giving each other the support as class teachers. We all want to do that as middle leaders. We want to do that as senior leaders. We want to do that with the community. Why wouldn't we want to do that with our early careers teachers? So I think I think where we've benefited from um me being new to role so it's just a year now that I've been with these current schools or any other schools that I'm supporting currently beyond um, our two it's about understanding the roads we had to take so we've also invited our ECTs because all all heads who have trainees in school you kind of day one is the beginning of their interview so we've had trainees with us for two terms luckily enough because of the lockdown where it was we actually got to have them throughout the spring lockdown when learning went to a, a remote platform and that's been brilliant and post that where I targeted people that I knew would would stay with us and would work well with our family they have been in receipt of some CPD as well so that not everything is daunting in September so they've understood what support I give current staff so they understand that they're already respected and valued and and, and I think that's the first step is create that family, create those relationships, make sure everyone feels safe so that obviously they can speak out. There isn't that fear and, and, and we enjoy our job. So the challenges have been overcome merely by adding clarity to our journey in our schools, because that might look different in, in Abby's or Alex's or Amy's. But actually what's best for us with the staff we have, with the community we have, with the needs our children have is this. So that sounds great. Thank you, Crystal. And I suppose, yeah, whilst we spoke a lot about um, consistency and equity, it is also about recognising that whilst um, the early career framework is a national framework that, you know, each school, each locality is very different. Each ECT is very different. Like Amy said, you know, and I'm in a similar position to Amy because we've done a three year degree that I have met of all my placements. I've only missed two weeks because of COVID, whereas some people have missed you know, two terms. Um, so actually each ECT is different. I think that's really important. So thank you, Cristela. And Abby, a very similar question as well, linking back, like I said in the previous question, that you work with lots of stakeholders related to the early career framework. Was there any, like, initial, what were the initial sort of barriers that you sort of had to, like Cristela said, a lot of hers was about that clarity and communication. Um, but what, you know, what sort of things did you have, feel that you had to combat with the people involved in that programme? Well, like Amy said, overcoming misconceptions. So, you know, what will this look like logistically and so on? So the first thing we did was um, structure a strategic, strategic response, meet with our, our principals, you know, look at, OK, logistically, what does this look like rolled out? So we could take away some of the fear of, you know, the how, how are we going to do all of this? Um, there was a lot of excitement, actually. So once we'd sorted out all of that side of things, Colleagues in our trust are quite used to being on a pathway. So irrespective of your role or however long you've been, we're not just teaching actually, because we have this across all our directorate. Everyone is following a pathway based on where they're at and what you know where they want to be by the end of that year. So this was just a new pathway, the early career teacher pathway. And I, I 
very much sold it around the idea of I'm gonna stay with the car metaphor. We're just taking our foot off the pedal a little bit. So this isn't about, you know, raising expectations, worrying people. It's saying, okay, we can't do this properly in a year. We know this. It takes at least two years and beyond. And actually what this is going to create is more opportunities for deliberate and purposeful practice. So we had a whole conversation about the benefits of, of practice. And we started to think about, OK, so if we took our foot off the gas and we we had the, you know, all of these um, statements and we mapped them across the two years. What would be the benefits of doing that? So then we started to look at timetables and look at the increase in practice that there might be. So there was a lot of excitement around it. We've also tried to give the pathway real kudos so we have our monthly webinar series where we invite seminal authors researchers in our sector to come along and share their work so it feels really exclusive it feels really exciting and actually we had colleagues who said can I just come along anyway I'm not an early career teacher um, which was obviously fine so yeah I think people need just to just feel like there is um, a real benefit to being part of it, that they're getting lots out of it, that it's responsive. So it's important that you're auditing need. We don't just presume that we need to blanket cover the whole early career framework and that they are novice in absolutely every single statement. With the first question we asked, which was probably the most powerful, what are you worried about? Let's just get a state of the nation in terms of all the things you're worried about. Um, the most prevailing point was parents' evenings because lots of our colleagues had never even experienced that. So even as a PGC student, for example, you would normally go and observe that in action. And OK, you know, you might have done that on Teams or Zoom, but it's definitely not the same experience. So we then started to think about how we could map experiences for colleagues as well. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. And so the last um, sort of question, that I can't believe how quickly this morning's gone already. So thank you so much because it's been absolutely fantastic. So the last sort of question I'm going to ask in sort of a two part question to each of you is um, sort of a tips question. Um, so I'm going to come back to you, Abby, for the first one. So with regards to the early career framework for other people in a similar role to you, say like a trust CPD leader type role working across a group of schools, what would be your top tip with regards to the ECF um, and how they are uh, going to organise that? And the second one is just a generic, not necessarily to do with the framework, what is your top tip for any early career teacher come September? Okay, I think my advice would be the same in response to both of those questions. So what I didn't spend enough time thinking about when we used the early release materials was how our early career teachers observe teachers who have expertise. So, you know, we had still adopted the model of giving them plenty of opportunities to go and see practice in action. But then when you speak to the early career teachers about what they had seen, understandably so, there was an obsession with the superficial and visible what of the lesson without necessarily thinking about the how and the why colleagues did it. And we had a reflective conversation about that and thought, okay, how do we tease out this library of experiences our teachers with expertise have and enable our early career teachers to gain insights into that? So then we start to think about the powerful questions you would ask a teacher with expertise. So things like, for example, um, you know, what were the most important learning moments that I should be aware of in your lesson? Can you tell me about something you were going to do in your lesson and then you changed your mind and what were the reasons for doing that? And obviously, when we're teaching, we know we might have three or four options available to us at any given moment and we make a conscious decision to choose a particular strategy in response to the needs of the children, but no one gets to see that. It all seems really seamless to an early career teacher. So what we've said now is, what's really important when our early career teachers observe other colleagues is they either go in, if it's possible, with um, a teacher who has expertise, who can help to signpost why the teacher has done particular things, or they have a conversation afterwards focused around a set of key questions that we've developed 
Um, and we've printed those questions in our letter to my NQT self book. If anyone would like to have a look at those, they're really simple, just four or five questions that you can ask a teacher to really dig deeper into their insights. So that would also be my advice to anyone who is um, mapping out and designing the early career teacher programme. I think the framework, if you follow that generally, you, you know, you've got it all sorted, but really think about um you know, practice in into observational practice in your trust or your hub. That sounds fantastic. Thank you, Abby. And Alex then, so similar question, your top tip to any mentors and top tip for an early career teacher. Um again, similar to Abby, probably they're probably going to be the same for both. But for me it'd be more something like it's a bit cheesy, but it's a marathon, not it's a marathon, not a sprint. I think it's really important to take your time with this, but also, I mean, when you do watch a marathon, I know this is really quite cheesy, even the best person who, who's, who's predicted to win that, that race um, still needs support. I mean, they still get water, they still get the cheerleaders, they still get everything that they, every every member of that race um, um, should be getting. And it's the same for any teacher or any ECT. Um, even if you feel you are strong, you mean, on that one day you might have like amy said that really bad lesson and trust me you will learn from that lesson and it's about you developing that resilience and remembering that you are not the worst teacher in the world because you've had that one bad lesson it's what you learn from that lesson is most important and then move forward with it but then <clears throat> i think again i've probably all seen this in our experience I mean, every class is different every every class of, of kids is different and when it when it when a when a trainee or an ect does have that one bad lesson and they feel as if it's the worst lesson in the world. They forget that they could be delivering the same topic the next period with a different set of kids and it could be an absolute success. You mean you can't, you, you have to develop that resilience and it does take time. When I when I meet with ECTs or trainees um, and we speak about resilience and they expect it to be there tomorrow and it's like, no, it, it won't be. You've got to take it slowly. You've got to take it easy. But one way you can do that goes back to observing. So we get them out and we see what the crux of that lesson maybe was. Um, and again, I've been teaching 10 years, but I still get myself, I, I still record my, my lessons if I know I've got a difficult lesson coming up that I think it's not going to be the strongest. And I will sit there with, again, a colleague or an, or an NQT and we, we will watch my lesson together and we will look at it and we will see the good things and we will see what I could do better. And I will then go and observe other people and see so therefore i i am a big believer of mirroring it you mean if, if, if i'm not leading by example then how can i ever speak to any trainee or any ect and say go and observe go and do this go and do that when i'm not doing it myself so they were the, they were the main two tips it's a marathon not a sprint and go and observe that is crucial i think to any development of a teacher thank you alex and then cristala top tips for head teachers and again and top tip for um new ects Okay, so it's, oh, I don't want to repeat. So now you've put me in a really tricky position. I've been thinking while both Alex and Abby were talking, oh man, you know, they've picked my ones. So I think I'm going to go with, um, let's go with policies and procedures. So I think it's our job as leaders to communicate how we do things in our schools. So um, the first and foremost thing is, you know, know your safeguarding rules, know the expectations, know what you're supposed to do in those what if scenarios. Know that, yes, it can happen in our school, those kind of conversation. And it goes beyond just that September inset training, you know, read the documents, be well informed and don't make it up. So there are policies and procedures in place for a reason. I think where um, perhaps some um, muddy areas arise or, you know, where concerns arise, it's because policy and procedure wasn't followed. So I think as, as a third, because I think um, taking each day as it comes, you know, it, it's, it's, is hugely important like Alex said the the power of observation came out in both and and they are key to success but I also think no policies know your procedures and 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 abide by them because you form your routines establishing on on um those those key documents so make sure you know those thank you Chris Sarah. and Amy a little bit of a different one for you but um what would you say you're top um tip is say for a 
PGC student who's going to be training next year um, and they're looking for a job or you're in your final year of training, what would you say with regards to the ECF? And then what are you most looking forward to as an early career teacher, which I'm sure is really hard to pick down to one thing because <laughs> I know I'm looking forward to lots of different things myself as well. Um, in terms of like prep for the ECT year, I think, I mean, I watched back the lecture that we had this morning just to kind of refresh. And one thing that stuck out was the um, the appropriate body. So there was our lecturer was kind of telling us that there was a student who didn't they hadn't the head teacher hadn't communicated with the appropriate body, which meant that the two terms that they'd done as an ECT year didn't count, so they had to do it again. Um, so it's asking. I know I, today I need to go and email my school to check who the appropriate body is and get all that all the contacts and have all the names just so that I know that's prepared. Um, I would say as well, I, I know I didn't realise that the ECF um, is still, ba you're still being assessed on the teacher standards, but they, they've changed it to the um, learn to and uh, learn that and learn how to. Um, so I think I'm going to go through that and kind of look at, same as you would for a placement, kind of plan, start to plan kind of things that you know that you can box off easily or start to like just get like a plan ready I know I'm you know me I'm a big organization freak I love, I love a plan I love a to-do list so just like you know heading for that um and what was the second question again what are you most looking forward to as oh. a ECT oh I think just oh, so many you're so right that's such a hard question I think I'm really looking forward to like running a full term um, extracurricular activity so that because I'm going into year one, which I'm really happy about, like the school took my preferences, which I'm so grateful for. But I also do love working with the older children. So I'm I'm going to do a, a club for like like a STEM club for like the, the key stage two. So I'm looking forward to having that kind of uh, experience to all kind of key stages. Um, I think I'm just looking forward to getting in the classroom again. Like it's been so long. I'm itching to get back and to just be there. And like the, like you said, I know I think everyone said it it is by far the best job in the world and yes it is the, it is probably the hardest but I think that's why because it, it's just the best it just gives you the best feeling and even on you know those days where like no lessons gone right and you're just tearing your hair out you can you know you just have that one lesson or that one child who like gets something they've been struggling with and you're like oh this is the best job <laughs> so, yeah loads it's just uh, yeah dead excited that sounds fantastic thank you Amy and Thank you. I know we've run over slightly. So thank you to our panellists this morning. Thank you to our attendees that watch it and also our attendees who will watch it back, I'm sure. Um, it's been a really nice event to talk through um, that early career, both in terms of the framework, but, but just starting your career as a teacher, being in a similar position to you, Amy. I'm incredibly excited the more I talk about it. Um, so it's thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those of you who supported Ed Connect this year. As this is our last virtual event of the year. We never imagined that we would do this many events. We'd have that many, over nearly 1,100 members signed up across 18 countries. Um, and so we're really, really pleased and glad of all the support we've had as a network. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning, which is a very rainy Saturday morning where I am. Um, and I hope you have a great weekend. And for all of the early career teachers out there and mentors and head teachers and directors of Institute, very best of luck next year for the early career framework. So thank you very much and have a good weekend. <laughs>